Good afternoon, good evening and welcome. Um, I hope that everybody has uh, worked through the technology connection challenges that uh, we face day to day and that we're all online and you can both uh, hear me, I presume you can, otherwise you don't know what I'm saying this, um, and also see all of the content online. So yes, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, ACS Industry Innovations webinar sponsored by Maine Pharma. My name is Gareth Lewis, I'm the uh, Vice President of Specialty Brands here at Maine and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar and to be joined by Dr. Shyam Subramanian um, to deliver the presentation. Um, very much appreciate you taking the time out of your working days or your early evenings, depending on where you are in the country, and I hope that you're all keeping safe out of the snowstorm that's going through a lot of the country. Dr. Subramanian is, is well known and well regarded in, in the pulmonology community, uh, so it's fabulous that he can uh, help us here with the, uh, the talk today. He is currently Chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care at Sutter Gold Medical Foundation in California and also Chair of the Clinical Pulmonary Network for the American College of Chest Physicians. He brings a great experience in uh, pulmonary uh, disease and also uh, work, working with a lot of fungal patients from origins of practicing in the mid Midwest. So it's very relevant that he can help us and provide a presentation tonight titled, What Was Old is New Again, a novel, more bioavailable antifungal. So with that, Dr. Subramanian. Thanks, Gareth, and uh, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, uh, everyone on the call. Uh, uh, hope you're all uh, safe for those of you in the midst of uh, some severe weather uh, conditions, and uh, glad to have an opportunity to spend some time with you today, and uh, appreciate Maine Pharma for facilitating this interaction. So today's talk would uh, will focus on a novel um, antifungal, which is uh, a talosura, which is a novel formulation of uh, itraconazole. And uh, so without further ado, we'll sort of launch right into it. So talosura is an azole fungal uh, indicated for treatment of uh, fungal infections in immunocompromised and non-immunocompromised adults with the following fungal conditions, blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, and aspergillosis. Uh, limitations, it is not indicated for onychomycosis, and uh, it is not interchangeable with other itraconazole uh, products, and uh, co-administration with certain drugs that might affect its metabolism or hypersensitivity are the only contraindications uh, to it. We'll get a couple of safety feature, uh, uh, factors out of the way. One is that itraconazole should not be uh, administered for onychomycosis. Uh, and especially uh, uh, should be used with caution in anyone with congestive cardiac failure and left ventricular dysfunction. Um, the nitrocortisol was administered intravenously to healthy human volunteers as well as dogs. Uh, there were negative inotropic effects seen. And so in anyone who where you are administering it, if they're undergoing cardiac or congestive cardiac failure, you do need to uh, have a, um, a certain level of monitoring that is uh, recommended. Uh, drug interactions, uh, there's a whole host of them um, that are listed out there. And I'll give you guys a, a moment to sort of glance through them. Fortunately, many of these are not routinely uh, in use in, in clinical practice, uh, but if you do happen to uh, have uh, an a, uh, this on the medication list, then certainly you need to pay attention to plasma concentrations of these drugs uh, due to those interactions. Other safety information includes hepatotoxicity, uh, which is uh, seen with citraconazole, uh, can be serious, uh, leading to liver failure and death, uh, and which is why the uh, routine monitoring of LSTs is recommended in anyone who is on itraconazole. Uh, this is certainly by no means common, but certainly something that we need to be aware of and monitor for closely. We already talked about the cardiac side effects, and uh, besides uh, inotropic uh, effects. There is uh, the uh, incidence of uh, cardiac dyspnea,s uh, especially uh, when there is co-administration with other drugs where there may be a drug interaction. Um, peripheral neuropathy has been uh, uh, reported as has hearing loss, and then of course hypersensitivity. Itraconazole is a is a known contraindication for this. The most common adverse reactions usually are nausea, vomiting, skin rash headaches, fatigue, um, 
And so those are the typical things that patients may complain about. Uh, very rare for any of these to result in discontinuation. By and large, interconazole and Telsura are pretty well tolerated. Uh, that is the contact information if you needed to report a suspected adverse reaction. So the format for today's talk, I'll go, uh, I'll give you a little bit disease state background into the three fungal indications that it, that Pulsera is used for, uh, has been indicated for, followed by uh, the, the, uh, a review of the latest guidelines for treatment or management of these uh, fungal uh, infections. And then we will uh, spend a few slides talking about how Pulsera is well differentiated and what is the rationale uh, for preferring use of Pulsera over more traditional hydroconazole formulation. We'll start off with histoplasmosis. To the right, you have the histoplasmosis endemic map that shows you the highly and moderately endemic um, areas, uh, pretty much uh, in the Midwest um, uh, regions in the central states there. Uh, the primary site of infection is the lungs uh, due to inhalation of airborne spores. In very highly endemic areas, hospitalization rates of up to 57% um, have been noted. The clinical manifestations can either be acute, where most patients recover between four to six weeks after development of symptoms. These patients, these cases often go undiagnosed. When they are diagnosed, they may not require any kind of specific treatment. The more likely uh, uh, clinical picture that you encounter as pulmonologists or clinicians is the chronic cavitatory pulmonary histoplasmosis. Usually occurs in those with risk factors such as elderly or those with pre-existing pulmonary disease such as COPD. Uh, it can, uh, down the road, lead on to uh, interstitial fibrosis uh, as well as interstitial inflammation and necrosis. Disseminated histoplasmosis is specific mainly to patients who are immunocompromised due to HIV, AIDS, uh, patients with hematologic malignancy, solid organ, hematopoietic stem cell transplants, other types of immunosuppressive uh, conditions. And uh, this, uh, uh, this may uh, disseminate via the reticuloendothelial system via parasitized uh, macrophages. Uh, disseminated histoplasmosis as well as chronic pulmonary uh, cavitatory histoplasmosis can be fatal is not effectively treated. The second uh, infection is uh, blastomycosis. And again, on the right is the endemic map uh, that uh, shows you the areas uh, where blastomycosis is endemic, mostly found in the Mississippi and also the Ohio River Valleys and Midwestern states. Once again, primary site of infection being the lungs. Um, only 5% of uh, pulmonary cases are currently, are currently diagnosed at initial presentation. And again, the manifestations of this um, uh, uh, tend to uh, evolve to a, an acute phase, a chronic phase, as well as disseminated blasto. Blastomycosis in particular is extremely difficult uh, to diagnose. Um, chronic pulmonary blastomycosis uh, it's, which you can see the X-ray or the pictograph on the right of the screen. Uh, it's clinically indistinguishable from tuberculosis. Uh, chest X-rays tend to show mask-like lesions. It can also be uh, mistaken for malignancies. Um, they, they, you could see nodular infiltrates. You could see cavitatory infiltrates. Skin lesions, uh, such as the characteristic pictograph on the right, depicts is also seen. Disseminated blastomycosis. Uh, can again spread to bone, skin, the urinary system, um, uh, as well as having diffuse cutaneous um, lesions. Aspergillosis is the last uh, uh, fungal infection we will review. It is also the most common. It is the second most common fungal pathogen in hospitals, uh, accounts for 30% of all fungal infections in cancer patients. Uh, there is no endemicity. It is really uh, pretty much seen all over um, uh, the, the US. Um, in invasive aspergillosis, particularly in transplant patients, it carries an almost 100% mortality. 
and infections are most likely to develop in those with predisposing factors. These may include pulmonary conditions such as COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, those with immunocompromised or immunosuppressed states, or those who are on long-term corticosteroid usage for rheumatologic conditions or other uh, transplant uh, patients or other uh, conditions requiring long-term OCS use. CPA or chronic pulmonary aspergillosis is something that pulmonologists frequently encounter. Um, it, there is more than 450,000 deaths globally per year as a result of CPA. So it is still a under-recognized cause of significant pulmonary-related morbidity and mortality. Uh, estimated morbidity rate is more than 3 million patients uh, per year. Um, X-ray, as, as you can see on the pictograph on the right, uh, they show cavitatory, basically, as the name suggests, a cavitatory lung lesion. It can frequently mimic TB or other cavitatory pneumonia, such as lung abscess or even malignancy. And you typically will find blood tests uh, positive for aspergillus or a sputum, or uh, in most cases, you end up with a bronchoscopy and a bronchoalveolar lavage uh, that is teeming with aspergillus. Uh, chronic cavitatory pulmonary aspergillosis, or CCPA, is a distinct subset of CPA, uh, which is a much more uh, classic kind of uh, cavitatory the lung lesion from aspergillus that is seen. Uh, itraconazole is the most commonly used uh, mold activazole for aspergillus, and triazoles are the only class of oral drugs that are available to treat CPA. So having given you a brief overview of the disease states, I will spend a couple of slides uh, just presenting an overview of what are the treatment guidelines and recommendations for each of the three conditions. And again, in the same order, uh, starting with uh, histo. For histoplasmosis, uh, when you use itraconazole, um, you have 81% achieved treatment success and 86%, and that treatment success is with therapeutic levels of um, itraconazole for at least two months. And, um, I will sort of highlight later why the emphasis on therapeutic levels becomes so important, particularly because the median duration of treatment time in these patients, remember most of these patients, you're not treating the acute phase, you're treating chronic histoplasmosis, chronic lung conditions, and so the median duration of treatment is nine months, and so the determinants of sepsis oftentimes may be the difference between having therapeutic levels of drug versus not having therapeutic levels of drugs. The IDSA uh, 2007 guidelines are presented on the right of your screen for mild, moderate, and chronic cavitatory pulmonary histoplasmosis. So for chronic cavitatory histoplasmosis, which is what as pulmonologists we frequently will see, you start off with 200 milligrams TID for three days, and then it's once or twice a day for at least 12 months. Some patients may need 18 to 24 months which is why the median duration of these treatment is typically about nine months. Acute uh, cases may not need treatment, but if the patients are symptomatic for more than a month, you could use isoconazole once a day or two times a day for six to 12 weeks. Uh, and then in more moderately severe to severe cases, you may, you may use it for about 12 weeks at a dose of 200 milligrams DID after loading with TID for three days. For blastomycosis, again, the extremely high success rates with the reconazole, 90% overall and 95% if there's therapeutic levels for at least two months. Median duration is also quite long, maybe not quite as much as the nine months with this dose, but at certainly at long enough at, at 6.2 months. And again, the kind of um, uh, patients that you will typically see this would be in life-threatening blastomycosis, uh, where you would initiate AMPOV, and then once the patient is stabilized and being discharged, you would switch it over to oral itraconazole. 
And for acute pulmonary blood flow, you could use a 200 to 400 a day for six months for disseminated uh, blastomycosis, non-CNS uh, involvement. You would use it for about 12 months. Vitroconazole still remains the drug of choice for treating blast flow uh, even after nearly three decades. And finally, we come to aspergillosis, which is probably the one fungal infection most of you, regardless of which part of the country you're in, they'll be most commonly seeing. Um, and those are the success rates. 93% uh, of patients with chronic pulmonary aspergillosis have improvements in clinical and radiographic features. 71% um, with long-term therapy. 63% of those with aspergilloma will respond. And in CCPA patients, after six months of oral triconazole, about 76% of patients uh, will have improved clinical and radiological uh, responses. So the vast majority of patients, you know, about 76% across the board will do well with, uh, uh, with the use of uh, triconazole in CPA. And these are the clinical guidelines. Um, and there are two sets of them. One is by the IDSA, the other is by the ATS. And so looking at the ATS guidelines, they are, they are somewhat overlapping and similar, but do have some distinctive features. So for chronic necrotizing pulmonary aspergillosis, with the ATS guidelines, you're gonna be using 200 milligrams of itaconazole CID for three days, and then once, or, once daily or BID for at least 12 months. And some may prefer 18 to 24 months. So somewhat similar to what we were seeing earlier for the other condition. Um, for ADPA or allergic uh, bronchopulmonary acidulosis, Ficonazole does have use in the ATS guidelines as a steroid sparing agent. And for invasive acidulosis, the recommendation is to use IV or Ficonazole until there is stabilization and clinical improvement, followed by either oral Ficonazole or Ficonazole. And uh, the IDSA guidelines for invasive, again, emphasize itraconazole as an alternative. Uh, also talk about itraconazole as an alternative for chronic uh, pulmonary aspergillosis and as primary therapy for AVPA. Uh, interestingly, the ERS and the ESC MID guidelines uh, recommend itraconazole as first-line treatment of choice for CPA patients. So let you take a second to review that. Uh, clearly, the bottom line here is that itraconazole plays a very central role in uh, the guidelines um, recommendations by both societies, the ATS, the IDSA, and certainly much more prominently with the ERS and uh, the ECMN. And that brings us to the Issues uh, relating to, related to conventional triconazole and how um, there is differentiation of um, Talsura. Uh, so the with conventional triconazole, which is the Spornox capsules, the bioavailability is 55%. And remember, we talked about the difference between therapeutic efficacy depending on therapeutic levels. So clearly, at a bioavailability of uh, less than 55%, this can play a significant role, especially when these treatments are being administered for nine to 12 months, sometimes as long as 18 to 24 months. And so it could make all the difference in the world between how long the treatment is going to be and how quickly can the treatment be effective and is the treatment effective at all? Um, uh, and so that is something that we need to keep in mind. And, and uh, some of that, Bioavailability uh, is impacted, or is the variability is impacted significantly by food food effects. So, if taken without food, Spornox um, can uh, bioavailability decreases by about 40 percent. And if it is taken with a PPI, which is very commonly prescribed uh, medication, the bioavailability decreases by 68 percent. With the result, interpatient variability tends to be very very high. And absorption variability can vary as much as 15-fold depending on the pH, the gastric environment, and whether uh, and, and the relationship of timing with regards to food. 
The oral pollution has a slightly better bioavailability at about 72%. Um, it also decreases with food, although to a slightly lower extent, about 30%. The interpatient variability continues to be high and very significant, relatively issues being uh, the nature of the oral solution that you're seeing. And so that sort of brings us to the main uh, topic of uh, today's uh, uh, discussion and focus, which is Talsura. So Talsura has a proprietary SUBA technology uh, that overcomes these challenges we just talked about with conventional etriconazole. The bioavailability compared, you know, compared to the 55% is 90%, so with two times more bioavailable than conventional etriconazole, and 84% of uh, subjects uh, with Palsura achieved therapeutic plasma levels uh, compared with conventional etriconazole, and uh, there is much reduced patient variability with this. Therapeutic levels in both uh, fed and fasted conditions uh, continue to provide adequate uh, and superior bioavailability, especially when compared with conventional triconazole, and there is absolutely no effect on the absorption with PPIs, and we'll see some of this data in the next couple of slides. The pictograph actually represents what the SUBA technology is in terms of the formulation uh, with solid dispersions as opposed to conventional hydrocarnosol, which is a crystalline formulation and hence has significant absorption variability depending on pH and food timing. So bioequivalency, again, you're comparing two different strengths. The Salsura, you're only needing 65 milligrams of drug versus 100 milligrams with Sporanox. And you can see the, the data set in um, terms of uh, the area under the curve. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, at every step of the way, uh, you could see that with treatment A, which is Salsura, compared with treatment B, you are um, achieving better mean levels, uh, depending on whichever metric of bioavailability you choose, whether it's CTROF, MAX, or the area under the curve, or the TMAX. Um, and this is better represented in a graphic manner uh, with this, where uh, plasma levels are relative to first drug administration based on days. You can see that pretty early on, by about day three, you are starting to see the difference between Halsura and Sporanox. And, uh, even by day 14, uh, the um, uh, traditional Sporanox um, is just about making it to the minimum therapeutic level, whereas uh, with Tulsura, the minimum levels are reached much earlier and are consistently higher despite a reduced dose. And so you have 90% bioavailability and two times the bioavailability of um, conventional triconazole. The important thing to note here is that despite the higher bioavailability, you do not have any higher incidence of side effects or adverse reactions. The safety profile is similar. And so uh, the majority of Telstra 65 milligram subjects achieve therapeutic levels versus Sporanox. 84% more Telstra subjects achieve therapeutic levels, two times greater relative bioavailability. Um, when CTROF was corrected for dose administration in a fed state, um, and total and peak uh, itraconazole exposures were relatively um, similar. Steady state concentrations reached within 15 days. This is important in, in terms of what we were talking about, the two influences of feeding and uh, administration of PPI will start with fed and fasted states. Um, so plasma concentrations in itraconazole are reached two to six hours are in both fasted um, and fed states. And you can sort of see on the graph there, um, on the uh, top is the fasted, uh, below is the fed. And uh, you can clearly see that uh, there is no difference uh, regardless of food timing um, on the bioavailability and absorption. Um, and so Talsura patients reach the therapeutic 1000 nanogram per ml therapeutic level 
in both said and fasted states. And this is clinically important for patients, especially if you're using BID dosing, for them to not have to worry about meal timings and you know when they can snack and when they can have their meals and then they could can or cannot have their conventional glucosal, you don't have those problems when it comes to Calcerta. Especially important when you consider that this is a treatment that you're going to be giving these patients for 12 months or 18 months. Very, very difficult realistically to expect patients to maintain a very consistent and rigid level of feeding restrictions over an extended period of time. Absorption of uh, Tulsira, again, is not reduced by co-administration of omeprazole. Uh, omeprazole, as you all know, extremely commonly prescribed uh, in the real world. And spe especially, again, you're going, going to be using a product that is potentially going to be used for 20, you know, 12 to 24 months. Many of these patients may develop nausea, gastritis, um, and may end up on intraconazole and on, on a PPI without a primary care or a gastroenterologist necessarily understanding or appreciating the drastic reduction in bioavailability of itoconazole with um, a PPI. And so this is good to see here that uh, Tulsara dissolves at a neutral pH. And so if, if anything, the uh, Tulsara with uh, trilocyte levels, you know, the peak levels um, numerically and, and visually you can see them to be higher, but certainly there is absolutely no impact um, in uh, overall in the bioavailability just by administ administration of uh, um, co-administration of omeprazole. There's a 31% increase in peak itraconazole of uh, exposure with co-administration of omeprazole. So a completely opposite effect for that to that of a conventional itraconazole. There is a size difference. It's a much smaller capsule. Again, less drug but more bioavailable, less bio uh, the bioavailability tends to be less variable and less influenced by food and PPI administration. Safety profile is identical uh, to conventional triconazole. Again, despite better bioavailability, there is no difference in the side effect profiles. The adverse events more than 1%. We already saw that in the very beginning of the talk and those are just listed there, uh, pretty much um, you know, similar in terms of nausea, vomiting uh, being the most uh, common effects. Skin rash can occur in about 9% of patients. And those are sort of the notable ones, at least uh, clinically, um, that you might encounter. So it also is appropriate for, uh, for patients with histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, aspergillosis, um, you have the convenience of not having any kind of lifestyle or diet restraints, and uh, you uh, have the uh, reassurance of reliability and maintenance of consistent and constant therapeutic levels over a pretty extended uh, therapeutic window. This is the, uh, the product uh, um, recommendations in terms of how these capsules should be swallowed whole, administered with food, uh, and you do not chew, crush, or break these capsules. For blasto and histo, we already saw the ATS and IDSA recommendations. So 130 milligrams, one today, that is 265 milligram capsules, um, and you could increase it up to a maximum of 260 milligrams a day, um, that is uh, two capsules twice a day. Um, and any dose over 130 milligrams should obviously be given in two divided doses. And uh, with aspergillosis, once again, it's uh, two capsules once a day or up to four capsules a day in two divided doses. Uh, and in life-threatening um, situations, um, a loading dose uh, could be considered with uh, 265 milligram capsules three times a day just for the first three days, and then you uh, cut it down back to the, uh, either the 260 milligrams per day or the 130 milligrams per day, depending on uh, the clinical uh, situation. Um, and so I think I'll stop there and uh, uh, just uh, wanted to briefly uh, touch upon the specialty pharmacy network that uh, really allows, uh, provides a resource for your medical 
uh, staff to be able to get patients access to this medication, um, especially for uh, commercial payers. Um, it becomes, you know, cost is generally out of pocket costs are generally um, never an issue uh, due to the patient savings card where they may pay as little as zero dollars. Um, and, uh, and even when the insurance is denied, uh, this may be, um, this, this may hold true. So as a result, um, access is seldom an issue thanks to the uh, patient savings card and then the specialty pharmacy network being a good resource for your patients. So I'll sort of put up this, uh, this summary slide of Tulsara versus conventional itoconazole and open up the floor for any questions. Great, thank you ever so much, Dr. Supermanian. So the, the Q&A box on the screen is live. Um, so for those who can see it, um, please send your questions there. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get through them as, as, as uh, they arise. So type it, start typing away as you go. If I can maybe uh, throw one, one uh, quick question at you, Dr. Subramanian. So, um, yes, just uh, in relation to the, to the food effect, um, yes, it's interesting to see uh, the, the slide as you presented relating to the, the food effects uh, or the fed fasted data with Tosura. Um, I noticed that the, the FDA, label, FDA label still says to administer with food. Um, can you provide any commentary around that? Right. So, so that is sort of the, you know, they're just based off of, the, uh, the data that was presented to the FDA, uh, clearly, clinically, um, the, we know that uh, the, one of the key advantages with Calcera is that bioavailability isn't related uh, to food intake, nor is it uh, affected by co-administration with PPI or with any kind of changes to gastric pH. And so this is one of those instances where, um, you know, the label is what it is in terms of um, the trial, how the trials were conducted, um, uh, and and how they needed to be conducted, um, but uh, we certainly, uh, I, when when counseling patients, um, we do advise them that one of the advantages they do have here is that uh, they don't have to maintain a rigid uh, dietary restriction when taking pulsory. Great, thank you. I'll just give everyone a moment to field a couple of questions before. If I can, uh, yeah, one, one other perspective, and certainly relating to PPIs, um, uh, you mentioned um, yeah, the, the data shown with omeprazole, um, and as you, you explained, many patients um, are prescribed um, PPIs. Uh, do many of your patients um, uh, commonly take over-the-counter PPIs, or you know, is, is your experience with PPI co-administration more um, prescription as well? I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think that the, the one it brings up a very key uh, point that PPIs, uh, at least over the past few years, do not need to be uh, prescri prescribed. And so, uh, especially in one, with one of the common side effects of uh, itoconazole therapy being uh, nausea or uh, symptoms that may mimic gastritis, uh, even if the patients are currently not on a PPI at the time of their initial prescription, uh, there is there is every possibility that unless they are counseled, that these patients may end up uh, either getting prescribed it or may just go to their pharmacy and and pick up an over-the-counter PPI uh, for gastritis or for acid uh, reflux symptoms, and uh, without understanding what a, a profound impact. Uh, this might have on their uh, fungal, antifungal uh, treatment. Uh, certainly at a primary care level, I think the awareness of the interaction between antifungal therapy and PPI administration is very, very low. And so I think both ways, be it through prescription or, or even over the counter, this is certainly something that um, uh, is a major issue with conventional to consult products. Absolutely. Thank you ever so much for that insight. Okay, we, we haven't any additional questions come in. We'll give everybody uh, two more seconds to remove any last shyness or see if anything else um, comes to mind. But otherwise, we'll look to wrap this up. So last chance, anyone? Otherwise, we will 
so thank you ever so much to Dr. Subramanian. Um, so thank you ever so much to everybody who has joined us for this ATS Industry Innovations webinar sponsored by Maine Pharma. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the content. I hope you found it um, educational and informative and you can benefit your clinical practice wherever you may be. So thank you again for joining. Thank you to ATS for the support and the um, delivery of this format. And we look forward to uh, being in touch with you uh, as and when we can. So take care and thank you very much.